This is the Wireless Communications Lab. And what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about uh, equalization in the frequency domain. And so we're going to talk about two important techniques. The first one is called uh, single carrier frequency domain equalization. And the trick here is that we're going to use a cyclic prefix to convert the linear convolution into a circular convolution. And then that's going to allow us to equalize in the frequency domain at the receiver. And then the second technique we're going to talk about, which is more widely used, is called orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. And then the idea here is that we're going to introduce a cyclic prefix, but we're also going to uh, convert the information from the time to the frequency domains. And that, that will make more sense after we present the lecture here. Uh, and then after this, you should be able to, for both single carrier frequency domain equalization and OFDM, you should be able to, to prove mathematically why they work. And then you should also be able to um, describe the appropriate transmitter and receiver structures. And then if we have time, we will um, go through some comparison of just time domain and the frequency domain equalization approaches. I don't know if we'll have time to get there. So start off here with um, some just a review here. So essentially what we established in the last um, lecture was that when we have a frequency selective channel, you know, so we need some sort of a mitigation of that frequency selective component. And so what we proposed to do was to introduce this uh, filter here which we call an equalizer. And so what we did in the last lecture is, this is an FIR filter. We talked about how can we compute the coefficients of that filter given an estimate of the channel. We talked about how to estimate the channel. So we use least squares to estimate the channel, least squares to compute the equalizer. And then once we've computed those filter coefficients, we apply that filter to the received data. And we apply this after the symbol synchronization uh, pieces. And there's possibly a delay associated with the equalizer that we correct using this delay element here. Now, one piece that's, that's missing here is I don't have the, free, the frame synchronization on the block diagram. The reason is that we haven't talked about how to do frame synchronization when you have a frequency selective channel. It's actually a lot harder. Uh, but we will talk about that in conjunction with frequency offset estimation, which we do next week. So, so you do have to have frame synchronization but we just haven't talked about the technique yet. But you could still imagine there's a box in there that does that. And so now we want to um, answer the question of how can we perform this equalization in the frequency domain. This is a kind of a blatant time domain approach involving the received signal with a filter. So can we do this in the frequency domain, for example, to reduce complexity? And so naturally the answer is yes. That's why we're talking about it. And that's what we're going to do right now. So to get some background here. So we're going to start off talking about single carrier frequency domain equalization. But I wanted to make, um, I wanted to look at some of the differences between like linear and circular convolution. So this is going to be single carrier frequency domain equalization. So what I want to do is I want to look at um, a special case of a circular convolution between two sequences here, one that's zero padded. So suppose that I have a sequence S of n goes from zero to n minus one, and another sequence H of L goes from L equals zero to L, this being our channel, this being our symbols here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zero pad H of L so that you know, I create a new sequence here such that, let's say, h hat of l is equal to h of l for l equals 0 through l, and h hat of l is equal to 0 for l equals l plus 1 through n minus 1. And now that those two sequences are the same length, I can talk about their circular convolution. So let's look at the circular convolution between s of n and h. Uh, 
I forget what notation we use here in the book, if we use the C or not here, but let's put that C in there here. And so this is just going to be the convolution, circular convolution written in this fashion here. Now I'm going to write this with H here for a reason that will become clear in a moment here. So in the last lecture, um, we identified this operation here with what we call circular convolution. And it's circular because of the modulo by capital N here. And this is only useful and defined for length N sequences. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute in the fact that I've zero padded this H of L here. And what that does is that lets me simplify the sum here. So now I can write this as the sum from zero to L h of l, and I still have the circularly shifted n minus l modulo n here. Now, what we can do here is we can rewrite this sum in two pieces here. So what we're doing is we're kind of implicitly assuming that l is, um, you know, less than or equal to n minus 1. And otherwise, you know, we couldn't zero pad it, right? It wouldn't make any sense. So what we can do is we can divide this up into two pieces. So you see, you have the, you have the case where n minus l is greater than 0 and n minus l is less than 0. Because where it's less than 0, then the modulo kicks in. So let's rewrite this to get rid of the modulo. So I'm going to put this equal over here. And so we can write this as um, the sum from l equals 0 to n, h of l, s of n minus l here. So if, if l is between 0 and n, then this quantity here is 0 or positive. So there's no need for the modulo. So that's good. Good stuff. Now we're going to sum from l equal to little n to capital L. And so we still get h of l here. But now we have the modulo kicking in, and then because this is negative and it's between um, 0 and minus n plus 1, we can just rewrite this as s of n minus l plus capital N here. And we can do this only for the case where, because you see how I have n here between 0 and l. So this is only for the case where 0 is less than or equal to n, less than or equal to l. Now, if n is greater than or equal to capital L, then if you notice here, n minus L is always greater than or equal to 0. So then, we, if that's the case, we can write this as the sum from L equals 0 to L, H of L, S of n minus L for n greater than or, sorry, n which it should be L plus 1. L. Now, L works here. L. Okay. So what we have right here, this piece here, this is actually a linear convolution, or at least part of it. Yes. And so this here um, is not a linear convolution because we have this little tail piece right here. That's the wrapping effect here. But this is linear convolution. And so the whole, the, the game that's played with um, single carrier frequency domain equalization and OFDM is to somehow figure out how to, how to get rid of, you know, this piece right here. And there's um, a main trick for that, which is the use of a guard interval or a cyclic prefix here. So for example, suppose that the first L um, samples of S were equal to 0. Well, if that was the case, actually, let's say the last L here. Yeah, it doesn't matter here.
Yeah, if the last, okay, if the last ones are equal to zero, then we would um, ax this little wrapping around effect here. So this, this is n, capital N, plus little n minus L. So this is like S of n minus 1, S of n minus 2, S of n minus 1. So if, so if that little n piece here was zero, we could ax this whole thing here, and this would look sort of like a circuit, sort of like a regular convolution. So that's an example of a guard interval. So what I'm going to show you now is something that's slightly different, which is the use of a cyclic prefix. So what we do with the single carrier frequency domain equalization is we consider um, still a set of QAM symbols here. So, so consider that we want to send S of n for n equals 0 to n minus 1. And these are, you know, what QAM or symbols. Of course, PSK, anything else in the, in the complex pulse amplitude modulation family works here. Now, instead of sending those symbols directly, I'm going to create a new waveform and send that instead. So I'm going to create a new sequence here, W of n, that has length n equals 0 to n plus L sub c minus 1. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a cyclic prefix here. of length L sub C at the beginning. So what that means is that the, the first few samples of W of N are going to be equal to N plus capital N minus L sub C here. Now let me think about this for a second here. It should be N, no, it should be 1. I've done this correctly here. Right. So for the first few samples, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the end, so let me copy this down here. So supposing that these are the symbols here, S of 0, S of 1, down through S of n minus 1. What I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this information here and put it back over here. All right, that's completely illegible there. All right, I'll, re I'll redraw that in a second here. Um, but basically, we're going to copy the, the last few symbols, and then we're going to fill in the remaining ones with, so let's say W of n plus L sub c is equal to S of n for n equal to 0 through n minus 1. So now let me draw this, um, this figure here. And slightly more legible fashion here. Notice I'm not promising perfect legibility, just less illegibility. All right, so let's draw, okay, so let's start with this here. This is W0, W1, W of L sub C minus 1, W of L sub C, dot, 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 down through W of N plus L sub C minus 1 here. So these are the um, symbols of W that we're sending here. And the way that this mapping operation works is that the symbols from here over contain the original data that we want to send, S0 to SN minus 1. And then these symbols here contain this repeated over here. So this is going to be S of n minus 1 down through should be S of n 
capital N minus L sub C, S of capital N minus L sub C plus 1. Assuming I've done the indexing correctly and haven't screwed up a factor of 1 somewhere, which I think is right. Okay. Here. And so this is the block of data that we are sending. And this is how this block of data maps to this block of input data here. So n symbols get mapped to n plus L sub c symbols here. So we're introducing some redundancy in the signal. But this is not redundancy in the sense of error control coding. This is a very special kind of redundancy because we're only repeating a few of the symbols over here and copying them back here. Now, the intuition of this is um, going to be that we're going to have our frequency selective channel convolution coming in, convolving, 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 convolving. And by repeating this little tail here, what we're going to do is we're going to create this right here. So instead of trying to get rid of this with the circular convolution, we're going to use this little repetition trick to create this piece right here and convert that linear convolution to circular convolution. So that's, that's like the intuition behind the trick. Now let's prove why this works here. So any question on just the, the forming the data here? That will become clear in a moment. All right, so this, this will, I think, become more clear. Not totally clear necessarily, but more clear when we do this derivation right now. So now let's, let's look at um, the received signal, you know, after match filtering, symbol synchronization, frame synchronization, assuming that um, we have a length L plus 1 channel. So this is the convolution between the received the channel L and the transmitted sequence W of N minus L, and we're going to neglect noise. Okay, so now looking at this here, um, what we want to do is we want to use the structure of the W that we've created here. So if we look at this convolution, so the, the way to prove all of these things here, especially if you, you know, forget the, the main trick, is, is usually to start like writing it out here. And so with this convolution here, first of all, we notice that if we write y of 0, that's going to be equal to h of 0, w of 0, plus h1, w of minus 1, plus dot, dot, dot. But the problem is we don't know what these are here. So these terms aren't useful. Just like when we were doing least squares channel estimation, we can't use this parts of the data that we don't know. So we just neglect that stuff here. We keep going, keep going, keep going. And we see, aha, y sub lc equals h of 0 w of l sub c plus dot, 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 plus, um, actually, this should be, Y of L, sorry. Down through H of L, W of 0 here. Ah, so now we're in good shape here. So we kind of see that Y of L is um, going down through Y of N plus L sub C should contain only the data that we're interested in here. So now let's look at this a little more carefully here. So let's suppose that um, we're going we're gonna to take L sub C to be greater than or equal to L. So what this means is that the cyclic prefix is at least as long as the order of the channel, not the length, the order of the channel. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at this received signal 
y of n plus L sub c here, which is just equal to the sum from L equals 0 to L, h of L, w of n plus L sub c minus L here. Now, if we start to write this out, what we'll see here, so I'm going to take this for n equals 0 to n minus 1. So I'm just taking like the last n samples here. So if we start to write this out, um, let's write out to, to c, let's write out y of l sub c. So y of l sub c is equal to h sub 0 w of l sub c plus h of 1 w of l sub c minus 1 plus dot 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 h of l and then this should be w of l sub c minus l here. Now, we, if we plug in for s here, we see that this is equal to h of 0, s of 0, plus h of 1, w, w of lc minus 1. We go back to my beautifully crafted chart here. w of l minus 1 is s of n minus 1. Okay. So that's s of n minus 1 here, plus dot, 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 plus h of L, and then this should be S of N uh, minus, let's see, L, actually N minus, L minus 1. I think, yeah. But, the point is that this piece here is exactly the um, this piece here is exactly this right here, and so you can keep going using the same argument here. So you know when we get to like y of l sub c plus l. That will be h of 0, s of l, plus h of 1, s of l minus 1, plus dot, 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 h of l, s of 0. And then, you know, we can continue on, and we're going to get h of n plus l sub c minus 1 equals h of 0, s of n minus 1 plus h of 1, s of n minus 2 plus dot dot dot, h of l, s of n minus 1 minus l, if I index that correctly. So the main message here is that this little piece right here corresponds to circular convolution here. And as we keep going, then we get back to the linear convolution. So, so basically all we've done is just create exactly this sequence here. And thus, what we've created is this, or this, or this. So this is just, um, we can say that y of n plus l sub c is equal to the circular convolution between h of n and the symbol sequence s of n, where I'm just writing this where we're assuming that h of n here is zero padded. So effectively, what we get is, to summarize here, so y of n for n equals 0 through L sub c minus 1, we just, we get something, we just throw it away, don't even care about it. And then y of n plus L sub c here, for n equals 0 through n minus 1 is the circular convolution between h and s. So this we're going to keep. Okay, so given that, the, the rest of this is actually um, pretty much done here. So let's call, 
let's say that y bar of n is equal to y of n plus L sub c for n equal to 0 through n minus 1. Then to equalize, all we have to do is we take the, um, we let y of k be equal to the endpoint dft of y bar of n. We let h of k be equal to the endpoint dft of h of n, where we're assuming zero padding. We let um, s hat of k be equal to y of k divided by h of k. This is like s hat. So these are kind of like in frequency domain here. And then, in the time domain, we let s hat of n be equal to the inverse dft of s hat of k. And so, I mean, that, that's actually it. I mean, that's, that's the basic idea here. So, as I am glutton for punishment, I will now draw the receive block diagram, which is rather painful. All right, let's draw it in two pieces here so that um, I don't have to draw these crazy lines here. So first of all, at the receiver here, we've still got oversampling. We've still got the um, mesh filter. Still got the symbol synchronization. here, and we still have this downsampling by M here, and for completeness I'll put in here this uh, frame synchronization operation here, even though keep in mind we haven't specified the algorithm yet for this frame sync, but we will specify that. All right, so this is the first part. Now let's go through the second part here. So we take the output here. And we need some kind of a blocking operation. So for this blocking operation, I'm going to use this um, term here, a serial to parallel converter here, which is going to take the input and stack it into blocks of length n plus L sub c. So then I'm going to take the output of this here, the first L sub c outputs, and I'm just going to ignore them. So I'm not going to connect them to anything. The other outputs here, going to be n of them, are going to be connected to a endpoint DFT block. Of course, this would be done with an FFT. Now, there's different ways to estimate the channel. Supposing we still estimate the channel in the same way as before, we might we might use this signal here and feed this into the channel estimator. So let's put this here, this channel estimate down here. You can still see that. And then um, okay, we have this thing coming in here, going into also a serial to parallel converter. with the outputs going into this endpoint DFT, where there's a whole bunch of zeros going in there because we zero padded that channel. And then the output here, each of these branches here, we're going to multiply through. This is H0 inverse down through H 
these are hats because they're estimates here, of n minus 1 inverse uh, And the outputs of these are what gives you the um, the H zero here. If that makes any sense. And then we take the output of this thing here. We pass it in through a endpoint inverse discrete Fourier transform. And we take the output of that. We pass it into a parallel to serial block that takes this n samples in and produces sequence of one sample out. And then we pass that into the detector. And we get out our detected symbols here. Yeah, yuck. All right, let's look at this for a second here. So the usual stuff happening here, symbol sync, frame sync. Main differences being now we have this blocking operation Discard cyclic prefix, take the DFT, estimate the channel, take its DFT. Equalization is happening right here. So this whole block here, this is, you know, where we're doing the equalization, which effectively is we're just inverting the channel and frequency domain. Now, really, the equalization, I guess I should draw this, the, is the whole thing right here. If we really want to replace that block that we had before, we have to we have to put in this entire piece here. So this whole thing here replaces the time domain equalization. Okay, so that's mainly it here. Complexity. Yeah, question. Um, so how is it, how is it that um, whatever the signal is coming into serial to parallel already has a specific signal? Already make or earn complexity? Because we put it in at the transmitter here. No, I did. Yeah, so I need to draw the transmitter block diagram too. So I'll draw that too. Okay. Yeah. So let me draw. Let me draw that because I guess I'll need it later anyway. Um, so the transmitter, you could imagine it looking pretty similar to what we had before with the bits going into a symbol mapping. And then the output symbols here, I could put a box here, which would be add cyclic prefix. And then the output of this would go into what we had before. Should probably not use L here because I'm using L for something else, so I'm going to put that as K. And this add cyclic prefix box, um, you know, we could write this in a little bit better form in terms of DSP operations using the serial to parallel. So this, this we could expand as, you know, the bits come in, there's a serial to parallel converter which goes from 1 to L and 1 to N. We take these outputs here, we feed them into a parallel to serial converter going from n plus L sub C to 1. So all of these outputs here get mapped 
over to here. Except that we also mapped the last few And that's the cyclic prefix. And then this right here is just the, the data here. It's the data there. And then, you know, so, so that's how you can think about this operation here. Now, the serial to parallel converter, you can actually write this operation using um, down samples and delays as well. So we can write this further using multi-rate DSP, but it's just confusing, so I'm going to leave it like this here. But um, hopefully you can see how to do that here. So yeah, so basically the transmitter, add extra redundancy, exploit that redundancy at the receiver so that we may implement this um, operation right here. Now, main point of why we do this is that um, is the complexity here. So think about how this scales with L, the complexity. So the, the complexity of this operation here, the equalizer complexity, for a block of N symbols, you know, we implement, you know, N inverses. We implement um, n multiplies, so they're complex. We have one, two, three endpoint DFTs, so that's like three n log of n. So that's our complexity here. Now the complexity of with the time domain approach would be something like k n. Let's say k plus one times n. This is time domain, and this would be the number of taps in your equalizer, and that would be the number of um, symbols you're trying to equalize here. This would be assuming you had a very straightforward FIR implementation. Um, and remember what I said last time was that this K here is generally proportional to L. So the longer the channel you have, the longer the equalizer you need. So if you have a 20-tap channel, maybe you need an 80-tap equalizer. If you have a 200-tap channel, maybe you need an 800-tap equalizer. But here, the complexity is totally independent of L. So you notice there's no L anywhere here, right? This is all just N. So the complexity is totally independent of the length of the channel. So if you had 100 taps, you know, th this complexity here will be much lower than that complexity down there. And, and you can go through and derive the exact trade-off, but typically it's on the order of like L equals 3, where OFDM star, or the single carrier frequency domain equalization has lower complexity than, than this brute force approach. Now there's other costs, though. There's overhead. We, are, we do have to spend symbols on this L sub C here, right? So if our channel's longer, L sub C has to be longer. So there's, there is an overhead issue as well. So the net throughput with single carrier frequency domain equalization is something like n over n plus L sub c. So then you want to make n long to make the effect of L sub c short, but then if n becomes too long, at some point the channel starts to vary, and there's other practical reasons that large n is, is not so um, useful. So you don't want it usually to be too big. So typical value of n would be 64, uh, 256, maybe. All right, so that's it. Took longer than I wanted. Questions? Yes. It's whatever it is here. I mean, if n is 64, then it's the log 2 of n, so going to be 8, so, you know, 64 times 8, I mean, it's not, not very high. Any other questions? 
This is complex. And this is just a rough order of calculation here. I mean, you know, I'm not trying to give you something really precise. Like, for example, this DFT here, because there's all these zeros, is actually less than n log 2 of n. Any other questions? OK, so now um, what we're going to do is um, we'll take a short break here, but I'll explain essentially the idea of OFDM before we do that. The idea of OFDM is simply that we're going to take this, um, this IDFT here, and we're going to shift it to the transmitter. And we're going to put it um, right here. That's essentially uh, OFDM. And so what we're going to do is instead of pushing all the complexity to the receiver, we're going to split it between the receiver and the transmitter. And we're going to move the IDFT so that we're taking information and converting it from frequency into time, let's say. So in single carrier frequency domain equalization, we imagine that the symbols are in time there's a frequency transform equalization converting back to time. In OFDM, we imagine the symbols start in frequency. They get converted to a time domain waveform, which gets shipped back to frequency and then equalized. So that's, that's what we'll do next here. All right, so first let's uh, stop, take one short break here. I apologize for the three undergraduates that are in the class. Um, we have uh, graduate student project proposals are due in one week. I think it's one week. It's the whatever it says in the syllabus, 22nd, 23rd. Um, that proposal is around two pages. And it should describe what you're planning to turn in for your final project. Uh, the guidelines are on the web, so I have the, the grading rubric and everything there. So it's just meant to be short. Essentially, I want to make sure that you don't do the final project in the last week of class, which I realize that probably you will do it in the last week of class. But. Hopefully not. Um, and in particular, it's an opportunity to get my feedback on what you might be proposing. So if you're doing some research already, uh, I encourage you to leverage that for this project. I, you don't have to do something that is completely new. You may not use anything from a previous course project. You know, and, and really, this should be work that you have started and are doing this semester. So you can't like take a paper you wrote and submitted in May and reformat it and convert it into the course project. Um, but you can take something that you're working on right now and format it and turn it in as a course project. That's fine. So any questions on that? There's, a, there's three options for the project. There's a literature survey, a research project, or an implementation project. The implementation may be done in the lab it may be done using other hardware, but implementation does not mean simulation. So there is no, um, it's not like a, there's not a pure simulation option. If you do a research project, you have to come up with something new. It can be small, incremental, <laughs> but, ha but it should be something that's slightly new. And a literature review does have to have a simulation component, but it should be comparing two or three of the techniques that you review in the literature. So those are essentially the three options. Uh, final project has to be formatted in LaTeX. Those of you who have taken my class know that. <laughs> LaTeX is the preferred means of um, presenting and publishing information in our field. So you should format it appropriately. Any other questions at all? Nope. OK. Undergraduates, you want to ask a question? Can you do a project too? Is that the question? Or? <laughs> nope. But uh, you know, maybe, maybe in the future, we can come up with like 571C, where we add the project too, and just add another credit hour. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we could just make it 671C or maybe even 971C. And then. Uh, oh, out of five instead of. So there'd be like another letter in there? So a B would count as like an A, B, A. 
<laughs> That's a good idea. I'm all, I'm all for that. I don't know if the university would approve. <laughs> yes, okay. We'll discuss that later off the video. Okay, now, the time we have remaining here, we're going to talk about OFDM. So OFDM is, stands for Orthogonal Frequency Division <laughs> Multiplexing. So OFDM, like single carrier frequency domain equalization, is, is really, you know, a name for a modulation technique. I mean, it, people think of OFDM as different things, but at least I think of it as a digital modulation technique. Single carrier frequency domain equalization, it sounds like just an equalizer, but really it's a combination of a transmitter and an equalizer structure. And so OFDM is a combination of a transmitter and equalizer structure. But it's all, it's all digital modulation. There's not... Um, really, you know, some sort of a frequency division multiplexing happening in the analog domain. It's really happening all in completely in discrete time. So the, let's see, I guess this, some motivation here, I mean, OFDM is used in uh, many, many commercial systems. And there's several different variations. Uh, there's one variation which is called OFDMA, where users are assigned different, what are called subcarriers. Um, but OFDM is essentially is used in IEEE 802.11G, A, N, A, C, And probably used in some of the other subletters as well. I think it's used in P and AF as well. Uh, it's used in WiMAX 802.16. It's more or less dead now. Most of you probably don't know what that is anyway. It's used in um, LTE Advanced. It's used in digital video broadcast and digital audio broadcast. These are European uh, standards. Uh, those are just things I can think of off the top of my head here. So it, it's a very common modulation technique. It's been the modulation technique of choice for the last probably 12 years um, for reasons of not just ease of equalization, but there's a number of other system functions that also become simpler when you use OFDM. So we'll talk a little bit about those, not too much. So let's look uh, first at the transmitter, and then we'll derive and show why OFDM works, and then we'll look at the corresponding receiver structure. So the transmitter is essentially what I just already told you here. We have the bits coming in to the symbol map. And what I do here is I'm going to expand that add cyclic prefix, I'm going to put in now this serial to parallel converter, just like I had before. I'm going to take the IDFT of these samples. And then I'm going to put in this block here that I'll call the add cyclic prefix. This is just that block that replicates the ones down here, and puts them over here. And then this is going to go into a parallel to serial of n plus L sub c to 1. And then the output of this will still go into the upsampler and be possibly filtered.
before being converted into the time domain here. And this GTX here, um, it could be a raised cosine or it could just be kind of a sink type pulse shaping filter. Usually it's not a complicated filter, it's just something that's like a sink. Now there's other variations of this OFDM structure. When we look at 802.11a, uh, we'll see that there's, um, in that standard, some mechanism for overlapping of adjacent groups of subcarriers to create some smoothing, so I'm not including that in here. But this is just a, a basic structure here. So again, symbols come in, we get a block of n symbols out, we take the IDFT, we add the cyclic prefix, we convert that back to the time domain. We upsample filter, that's it. So with OFDM, we send the IDFT of samples. So we don't send symbols themselves, we send the IDFT of a group of symbols. And so the terminology with OFDM, often we refer to this, um, this whole group of symbols here as like the OFDM symbol. And we refer to the outputs here as the samples. Okay, so let's write an equation for what is happening right here. So let's write that again as W of n. Let's write this for the first um, block of data. So we know that um, we're, yes? Um, which point are you using on that? That's the serial to parallel converter. So the W of n here, um, with OFDM, we can actually write this in a very tricky way. So the IDFT looks like this here, sum from 0 to n minus 1, s of m, e to the j, 2 pi, m over n. What I can do, though, is I can actually write this like this here. I'm going to put an n minus l sub c here. I'm going to let this be W of n for 0 through n plus L sub c minus 1. And because of the periodicity of the complex exponential, writing it in this way automatically adds a cyclic prefix. So you can see that if I plug in W of 0 here, I get 1 over n, sum of n equals 0 to n minus 1, S of m, e to j, 2 pi, m minus L sub c over n, but complex exponential is periodic, so that's equal to sum over n, 1 over n, 0 to n minus 1, S of m, e to the j, 2 pi m, capital N minus L sub c over n, which is just equal to the, um, yeah, n minus L sub c here. Which sum? The sum from n equals 0 to n minus 1 when you say plus minus. Because we still have. Oh, sorry, this should just be m, that's why. Yeah, overuse of one letter. Yeah, so. Things to remember from, you know, this lecture here, this is one of the key points here is that we can write the OFDM transmitted signal in a very elegant way where the cyclic prefix is just built into the index here. So, something to keep in mind here. Most, um, and by the way, most presentations on OFDM, like if you look at other classes, they take like two or three lectures on this. So you're somehow getting it all in like half a lecture. It's pretty amazing. Um, the reason is that we do single carrier frequency domain equalization first, which most people don't cover at all. But mathematically, when you understand that, it's easier to go back to OFDM. And it's also easier to understand it from the DSP perspective, rather than this, this sort of weird approach that's often taken in communications classes. 
So the net of this is that we have created a signal with a cyclic prefix. So that's, that's the net of this operation here. So now let's look at the, um, the trick at the receiver, and then we'll write the receiver block diagram, which will take you know, probably the rest of the class just to draw it out. OK. So look at this following signal here. So examine the signal y of n is the sum from 0 to l, h of l, w of n minus l, plus v of n. Um, so we have a signal here with a, re with a cyclic prefix. You're kind of guessing that we're going to go again for circular convolution. So let's just go ahead and, and jump to constructing this new sequence y bar of n, which is equal to y of n plus l sub c for n equals 0 through n minus 1. So we're going to get rid of the cyclic prefix here. And then let's just go ahead and, and plug it in and see what happens. Well, let's plug in here. Get sum from 0 to l. h of l. w of n plus l sub c minus l. Now, we substitute in our nice, elegant representation of wn here. So we get sum from l equals 0 to l, h of l, 1 over capital N, sum from m equals 0 to n minus 1, s of m, e to the minus j, sorry, e to the j, 2 pi m, n plus l sub c minus l minus l sub c divided by n here. So the key point here is remember the minus l sub c here, plus l sub c here. So here we have plus l sub c minus l sub c, and a minus a little l. So we can rewrite this as sum from l equals 0 to l, h of l, 1 over n, sum from m equals 0 to n minus 1, s of m, e to the j, 2 pi m n over n, e to the minus j, 2 pi m little l over n. Now what we're going to do is we are going to um, pull this m out. And see this right here, e to the j, 2 pi m l? That looks kind of like if I push this over here, it starts to look like the Fourier transform of this. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to push this here. So I'm going to put 1 over n here. Sum from n, m equals 0, 10 minus 1 here. Sum from l equals 0 to l, h of l, e to the minus j, 2 pi m l over n. S of m, e to the j, 2 pi m n over capital N here. So all I've done is just reorganize these terms here, change the order of summation. But that, that is in fact the DFT of, of H. So, and that's the endpoint DFT, because look, there's an N there. So it's like if we zero padded the H here. So this is 1 over N, sum from M equals 0 to N minus 1, H of M, S of M, e to the j, 2 pi m over n, here. OK, so look at this right here. What does this look like here? What does this function here look like? It looks like the inverse, DFT, of a sequence that happens to be the product of h of m and s of m. So if we take the DFT of this y bar of n here, what we get out is just that right there. I'll call it, let's see, m. 
So I can just put in N here. Yeah, because this is just, you know, you can you can just think about this as like some signal here X of N, right? So this is just like the IDFT of some signal X of N. So we take the DFT of it, we just get back X of N. So that's it. Now look, what we've got here is these are the symbols we sent in the time domain, S of N. These are QAM symbols. This is the channel in the frequency domain here, H of N. So the channel affects our symbols in OFDM by taking the symbol and scaling and squishing it because this is just a complex number. So the whole, oh, the whole block of symbols, each symbol is affected differently by the frequency response of the channel. So that's the main idea here, OFDM here. Now we could go through, uh, sometimes I go through, I mean, we could go through and take the DFT of this right here, but that's just going back to proving why the DFT and its inverse are related, so I'm skipping that. Now let's go through and draw the block diagram. Okay, how much time we have here? Oh, plenty of time. All right, we have the same stuff at the beginning of the receiver like we had before. Every time I do this lecture, I think I should just reprint, print out all these figures ahead of time. And for some reason, I think, no, students will get more out of it if, if you know, we draw up the figure. I don't know. Is that incorrect? Maybe that is. I'll tell you that this symbol sync is, um, first of all, we're not really operating on symbols here. And second, this is almost never used in OFDM, so we can probably ax this piece here. But I'm just leaving it in for consistency. And then we are still going to have the, um, the frame sync here. Now again, frame synchronization, we haven't discussed it even harder in, in some sense with OFDM because we don't have the symbols. We have their Fourier transform. So it, it, it's, um, it's a bit different. Okay, so now take this over here. No, actually it should be easier. So I have serial to parallel converter here, one through N plus L sub C. As before, we toss the first L sub C samples here. Now we take the endpoint DFT, those remaining samples here. And we have what looks like what we had before with single carrier frequency domain equalization. And then we take these outputs here. Now with single carrier frequency domain equalization, we convert it back. But here, we're already, we've already got our symbols. So we just take this here, we pass this to a parallel to serial converter, N to 1, and pass this into our detector here. So the outputs here, now, we need to estimate these channels. We'll talk about channel estimation on Monday in the next lecture. Uh, there's different ways to estimate the channel. Normally, though, we would op operate in the frequency domain. So we would actually take the data from here and put that in. You don't have to, but that's typically the way it's done here. So then this would go into the channel estimation block. And then this estimation can be done in the time or the frequency domains. 
Um, the best approach, probably doing it in the time domain, though that's the highest complexity. But let's say, you know, it could be channel estimation, could be done in time domain, so it could be a ser serial to parallel and another DFT. Leave that there, here. Yeah, so that's it. I mean, that's the OFDM receiver here. The, the, um, so we haven't talked about frame sync. We haven't talked about frequency offset yet. That we also do next week. And then we'll also talk about what happens in the channel estimation piece here. But otherwise, it looks like the single carrier frequency domain except we have um, moved the IDFT to the transmitter. So that's essentially it here. So look at that. Wow. We've concluded that quickly. So questions about this? Yes. Oh, why is in the time domain? What? Why? I mean, I mean, we just we just arbitrarily labeling it time. Right. So I mean, it, all it is is a mathematical transform. Right. That's all. And there's other approaches too that use other bases. I mean, if you were to replace that with like a walsh hadamard sequence, you'd get something like CDMA. If you replace it, you could use wavelets and get something else. So it's really just a transformation a pre-coding operation on the transmitted symbols. But we call it frequency domain just because of the whole interpretation that at the end of the day we get an input-output relationship that will look kind of like this here. So the input-output relationship we get is, is kind of as if we sent the symbols in the frequency domain. So, so that's just really why we, we call it that. I mean, it's... It's like an interpretation of it. And so then a lot of times we also write the symbols using kind of like the frequency domain notation instead of the time domain notation, <laughs> just to keep it consistent. So other questions? Yes. Uh, apart from sharing the complexity between the transmitter and the what does uh, OFDM have more advantage over the uh, frequency domain equalization? Well, a lot of the advantages are things that we um, we don't really touch on in the class here, but one of them is, um, is is resource allocation and adaptation. I mean, it is easier to support multiple users by assigning them different subcarriers. You can also adapt better to a more easily to a frequency selective channel by allocating subcarriers different rates, different power levels. Um, it also turns out that. OFDM plus coding works a lot better typically than single carrier plus coding. I mean, these are all things that depend on the coding and everything else. But um, you get what you get here is something that looks like a time varying flat fading channel. And then what you get with the single carrier frequency domain equalization is the error is sort of spread in a more uniform way over the symbols. So, so you don't, uh, you get diversity in a, in a different way. I mean, this, the, I guess, I guess you can get diversity in, in some sense in OFDM and not as much in single carrier frequency domain equalization. But there's cases where, and there's actually a lot of settings where OFDM doesn't work as well either. So you can come up with, you can, si you can simulate different channel models and one will be better than the other. It's, it's not... Um, it's, it's hard to prove like why one is fundamentally better than the other because they're both sort of orthogonal transformations and you know from an information theoretic perspective they should be similar. But practically how you optimize the transmitted signal is different in both cases. Um, so I don't know, that's not a very good answer but there, there's, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer it 
with the material we've covered so far. Hmm. So let me p just put some comments here on, on the comparison since um, we have the time here. So. time do we have? Oh, we have four minutes. All right, I'm going to be, I'm going to just uh, put up my comparison table here instead of trying to redraw it here. Okay, so I was trying to, you know, think about this more about the um, the, com the differences between time domain equalization, single carrier frequency domain, and OFDM. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that the time domain equalizer that we talked about is not in in any way the best time domain equalizer. Best time domain equalizer um, has very good performance and and much much higher complexity. So, so I'm not considering that. Approach. I'm just comparing with what we talked about in class. This is the K order K linear filter. This is the one tap FFT IFT combination, then the one tap frequency domain combination here. The receiver complexity depends on the length of the filter with the time domain approach and is fixed in the other two approaches. Now, um, I realize here I didn't include the FFTs for the the channel, but that depends on how you estimate the channel. You know, the, the changes at the transmitter for single carrier frequency domain equalization is inserting that cyclic prefix. So I consider that kind of a minor change. It's just kind of replicating some stuff you've already computed, so not a big deal. OFDM, you need the IFFT. Um, the complexity scaling with the, the channel, the time domain approach does scale. The other two approaches don't scale. In terms of complexity, the overhead scales. There's another um, quantity here. It's called peak to average power ratio. And if you were to look at this, this would be defined something like the maximum of the envelope of this complex signal X of T. Actually, yeah, I think that's I think that's the right way to define it. Divided by something like the average here. Let's, let's put squares on both sides here. So peak to average power ratio is, is a measure of how peaky the signal is. So a, a signal that, um, like, a, like a, a complex sinusoid, for example, would have amplitude one. So you know, if, then the output of an OFDM signal, OFDM modulator looks kind of ugly like this. And the output of QAM, as you've already seen in the lab, you know, it's sort of smooth. And if you take its modulus, you get something that um, is reasonably flat. The difference between the peak and the average, the average is not very big. It's a few dB. With OFDM, it tends to be very big. So what this means is that for a transmit, um, from the perspective of the transmitter, you have to design an OFTM signal for a larger dynamic range, or you have to be prepared to have um, clipping or some, some other effect, right? So if you, if you put, like, suppose you put, like, the all one sequence into an IDFT, what do you get out? You get out a big, a big delta with amplitude n and a bunch of zeros. Right? That's kind of like the worst case, whereas with the single carrier frequency domain equalization, we have our QAM symbols, you know, they're just always coming out with the same, roughly the same modulus. You know, if it's 16 QAM, there's two different levels. So the peak is, is only a little bit different. So that, that's actually a disadvantage of OFDM. It has some implications on the hardware, um, the tolerances of the hardware, the hardware design. Um, and that can make OFDM worse in some cases if you have really cheap, crappy hardware. It's also more sensitive to, to synchronization, which we didn't talk about yet, so I was going to mention later. Um, and then generally, OFDM requires other algorithms to do channel estimation and synchronization than does the, the cyclic prefixed approach. Okay, 
so that's um, that's it for the complexity here. Wait a second. Shoot. Did not show my OFDM sign here. All right. I'll have to cut these back in the video here. So single carrier frequency domain equalization, this is what we talked about first. So you should be able to explain the idea of the cyclic prefix and prove mathematically why it creates a circular convolution, why that lets us do equalization in the frequency domain. Same thing with OFDM. You should also be able to describe the OFDM modulation, uh, draw the transmitter and receiver and prove that it works, and then should be able to explain some of the differences between um, time domain equalization, single carrier, and OFDM. So in the lab, you, you will implement time domain equalization and OFDM. We don't implement single carrier frequency domain equalization, though it's not that hard based on what you do, but we just don't, don't do that in the lab. Okay, so that's it.